Hi there. Welcome to the More Civil Podcast. This is a podcast for Blacks, Asians, and those who love them. I am Mo, and I am your host, ready to spark your curiosity as I take you on this adventurous ride of exploring cultures through the stories of my guests from all over the world. On this show, we get really personal, discussing salient issues that are relevant to our contemporary age and also building community around them. As our guests exercise courage and vulnerability in sharing their life's experiences, we hope that in turn, you are inspired by them and that you get the courage in it to set your own stories free. Enjoy the ride and thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Welcome back everyone to the Most Civil Podcast. This is Mo and... I'm Day. And today we have a returning guest to the podcast. Uh, for those who have been following us since 2018, you probably recognize her name and maybe even a bit of a story. And it's been such a long time since we had her on the show. It was really nice to you know bring her back and kind of get updated on what she's been up to. And I know she's been doing amazing things because I follow her on Facebook and we're going to get more into all of the fancy things she's been up to. So um, without further ado, please permit me to welcome Malungo back to the podcast. She's a Pan-African thought leader who blogs about African and global issues. Her platform is called Angola, which is like a derivative of her name, which I think is very brilliant, by the way. And its mission is to change the narrative about Africa as a continent that has little to offer Africans and the rest of the world. So she's seeking to change that um, narrative. Um, her blog provides news, insights, and analysis on business, economy, lifestyle, people, politics, sports, and travel. All of this fun stuff. And her blog has a global audience of people who have a genuine interest in and passion for Africa. Malongo, welcome back. Welcome. Thanks for having me. It's so great to be here. Thank you. So you've been living, I know you've, I remember when you came on the show and you told me all the countries you've been to, and I tried doing that dotting on the map. I kind of had like a whiplash. So I know you, you were in Singapore until very recently when you moved back to London. So how has it been like going back to London? And is this like a final move for you, you think? So just, uh, I guess for the audience, just to give you context. So I lived in Singapore for nearly four years and I absolutely had the best time. So I'm sure everyone hears about Singapore and I can tell you that everything you hear about it is true. It really is one of the most efficiently run, squeaky clean, safest country that you will ever live in. I mean, I used to ride my bike at 5 a.m. in the morning um, when it was still dark and I'd walk in the night when it was dark and I never once had to look over my shoulder. And you came back to London? Um, and my favorite airline <laughs> <laughs> I, well, this is the thing, right? So now that I'm back in London, I wake up every day and I ask myself, <laughs> why did I move back? Oh, yeah. you know, like, I clearly didn't think this through. And if I have to think of a TikTok meme that, that would best sum up my decision making process, it's the one that's trending now, or it's been trending for a while, which says, I don't oh, want peace, I want problems. <laughs> Probably sums up my move to London. All the time, yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, just aside, so I was away for nine years in total. Um, and I think I was just at that stage in my life where I needed to put down some roots and have some stability. So in those nine years that I was gone from the UK, I lived in four different countries. Um, and then being Zambian and British, my only two options really were either move back to Lusaka or come back to London. Um, and I chose to come back to London. So even though London's not the safest place in the world, I have to say it's nice to be back close to family and friends, um, people that I've known for a really long time. And the nice things about living in London is that it's such a multinational um, city to live in. It's so cosmopolitan. As a black African woman, it's nice not to pay $180 to get some really bad cornrows in my hair, like what I used to do in Singapore. <laughs> Um, it's nice to be able to eat all kinds of food again without really worrying about lack of diversity and, and like my culinary options. Um, so it's great to be back. Uh, it's changed a lot since I was here. I have to say like the pandemic has definitely taken a little bit of London's soul, uh, but you do see it coming back. So overall, the good does outweigh the bad and it's actually nice to be back. I, I want to ask a question, but first of all, <laughs> I wanted to say... Um, so one of the fascinating things about London for me, I, I first, I'd been living in Edinburgh before I came to 
I never lived in London, but like before I visited London at one point, um, and I will never forget the experience of walking down a street and hearing somebody speaking Yoruba behind me, <laughs> which is like the, you know, the language of the part of Nigeria that I'm from. Um, and I wonder if that's an experience you've ever heard. Cause I feel like only in London, it's like, there's some things that are like only in London. You can literally be walking around and hear people speaking your language. And that can be all kinds of language from all kinds of places in the world. And there's not many places in the world where I think that would happen. So I was wondering, have you ever heard (laughs) any, anything from Zambia in London? Yeah, totally. Just like randomly walking down the street. Yeah. I, I, and this is the thing you never know who you bump into. So I agree with you. I've overheard people speaking in local language on the tube or when I've gone to Brixton to buy hair, like you can see people want to go and buy food that's as closest to home. Um, and you're totally right. That's the good thing about being in London. And I think after having lived in like Dubai and Singapore, I always have to tell myself like I'm back where there's loads of black people. Cause in Singapore, you see a black person, you chase them down you don't the need road. To hug everyone anymore. Them with, with I know. Like you just want to hug somebody. And when I came back, I had mm. to psychologically remind myself that I was back in London and I don't have to greet everybody. Um, but yeah, you're like, no, I don't. I don't have to. But I, I do I do smile and say hello. Um, I think it'll take a while to stop doing that. So I guess the question I wanted to ask was, you said London felt like it had lost its soul when you came back. A little and bit. And I'm really curious, what, what was lost for you? So what, 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 what did you find missing? So, I mean, just walking down the streets, you see like the high street has really been destroyed. So I think it's a combination of two things. It's the pandemic. So a lot of stores were unable to sustain you know, just sustain their businesses and have really closed down. I see it in London. I just got back from Oxford where my office is and you see it in Oxford as well where shops are gone, like shops that have stood for a long time. I'm talking decades and a part of the community. Um, So I used to live in Chelsea before I left and I'm back in Chelsea now and it's the King's Road is not what it used to be. You read about the King's Road um, in a lot of pop culture and everyone tells you it's hip and happening. It just doesn't feel that way anymore. And then also what's funny as well about the UK is as, a, as Africans, we always condemn our politicians for being incompetent and being corrupt. And I don't know if it's a combination of the pandemic or people just don't care, but you come here and it's actually exactly the same. Politicians here are just yep. as bad. Um, things are a bit more inefficient than they used to be. Um, you know, the strikes are still on. People don't really want to work. Um there's inefficiencies, which if you weren't coming from Singapore, become a lot more apparent. Um, and I think that's one of the things living in Singapore. Uh, and I was telling some people that the West doesn't even realize how far behind the, the West has become. Like when I go to the U.S. and I'm here in London, and you compare that to Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan. It's like we're not this is not the first world anymore. Like definitely at least second world. And the first world is actually out in Asia. <laughs> I think the irony is that they're still stuck in that old days of Western number one, but it's like uh, things are efficiently done in other countries, you know, borrow a leaf or two from them. Um, <laughs> I love that. But you're seeing it definitely. I think even like I, as much as, you know, with what's interesting about the Ukraine war and it's really tragic what's happening to Ukraine. But when you step aside from that and think of the geopolitics, it's it, there's a clear divide between the West and the rest of the world on how to treat Russia. Um, And the fact that countries like India, South Africa, um, Pakistan were so willing to publicly go against what the Western masters, as they like to call themselves, instructed is very telling as well about the shift that we're seeing that you only observe, actually, if you're outside of the West. Like, it's less obvious when I'm living in London, I'm watching BBC, like you don't see that. But when you're actually living outside of these countries, that's when you start to see that the world is shifting. Yep. I always say you get to know more about your country when you leave, you know, that country and travel elsewhere. So well, you've lived in South right? we, we are more African living Central, outside of Africa. Yeah. Yes, because we yes, yes. in the day-to-day drama of our country. So we're super patriotic and we appreciate the stuff. It's the same thing for everyone. Sorry, you were saying. I, I, no, no, no. I mean, you're the guest. So, um, so the next question I was going to ask was this. You lived in several countries, and I'm curious to know. I probably have the answer because you've talked about it, maybe. What's the most interesting country you've lived in and why? Huh? 
Ha, actually, I'm going to tell you because you think it'll be, I'll say Singapore, but no, actually, yeah. I've lived in nine countries, including Zambia. And what's interesting is every country has something that is special about it. So in my country, Zambia, Victoria Falls, National Park, people are really friendly. Uh, when you think of the UK, which is, the, well, actually, you know, Belgium was the second place I lived. You know, you've got chocolate, you've got diamonds, you've got classic cars, oh, you've got the, the EU, um, <laughs> the chocolate and the waffles. The waffles. The uh... UK was the second place, or the third place, I, well, second place outside Zambia where I lived. And, you know, I love the UK, even though it frustrates me sometimes, but great culture. I'm a big fan of the Royals. I went to Oxford. I still love, love Oxford. Um, and then I did Italy as well. And the only thing I'll say is fashion. Like when you think of the fashion houses, so Dolce & Gabbana, Valentino, Versace, Fendi, you can go on. Japan was special, great culture. And you like Korea. So I think you would understand like Asian culture yeah. is actually really special. I lived in Mozambique um, two years after the war. That was amazing. The people are really nice. Mozambique has some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Amazing food. I lived in South Africa. Everyone thinks of South Africa as you know, just having high crime, it actually probably is the most stunning country in the world because it has everything. So beaches, mountains, wildlife, you name it. Dubai, I lived in Dubai. It's probably the most fun place I've lived after London. Um, actually more fun than Singapore. Um, and then Singapore as well. So all of them have something special. And I think the learning for this is that if you go to countries and you want to appreciate the culture and assimilate yourself in the way that they live, you'll find that every country is interesting. So much so that now I'm of the belief that if you send me to Yemen, I'll probably come back and say, I loved it because I found it. <laughs> but that's just kind of the attitude you develop when you've lived in a whole bunch of places, that every place is special. So you're basically saying you okay, love all your children. That's actually Nicole. very smart, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, I was going to also say that. Like, What a smart way of answering that question. Like, I love them all. Nicole. And I think you're right. Wherever you are, there's always life to be found. And you know, just find your niche and enjoy it. It's funny you mentioned Mozambique because as an African, we hardly hear about that country. I haven't heard about that in a while. Like it's, I don't really hear about Mozambique like in in news or just I've never met someone from that country before. It's kind of you weird see, how as Africans. My blog because Mozambique has, I think, and I don't want to make this up, but it's several billions. It could be twenty billion dollars worth, actually twenty billion dollars of investments to find gas. They have some of the highest gas deposits in the world. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a very wealthy country if they can sort out the corruption because they also have a big scandal. They had one of the biggest uh, financial scandals of $2 billion that went missing. Um, they've had um, a terrorist. There was a whole story about terrorists who were attacking the oil and gas and mining companies in Mozambique. The government didn't sort it out, allegedly, because they're in on it. And then Rwandese soldiers went in and sorted it out very quickly. It's actually a really fascinating country. And one of the reasons I started the blog was to actually talk about these issues. So I have oh. one article on Mozambique, but I'd love to write um, a feature story on travel because it really is one of the most stunning places to visit. I think um, this might be a good segue into talking about just Africa as a whole and what your website does, because you've kind of eased us into it. So tell us a little bit about Ongolo and I guess what you, what was your inspiration behind starting that, which you've talked about, if you could flesh that out more and just a little bit about what you do. So what inspired me to start the blog is I've always wanted to do a, a news, like a media site or Something that promote that actually talks about Africa from an African perspective. So we talk about African stereotypes, and one of the ones that really frustrates me is that people think Africa is very barren. There's nothing there, and zero civilization. So even as late as 2020, I'd be sitting in a room, and people would would call Africa the dark continent. Um, and literally, like this dark continent comment came. Um, maybe four months before I launched the blog and I was really shocked and like in this day and age that's all you think about Africa actually no someone called it deep dark Africa and that was very shocking to me I'm not joking um, in a work setting and you'd think people would not say stuff like that but people do and so I was like you know I can get angry about that or I can do something and I find that a lot of the times right it's just a lack of education, it's about lack of knowledge. I mean, you talked about Mozambique and not seeing stuff in the news, and yet there's actually a lot of content out there about Mozambique. Um, so it's not just non-Africans who don't know, but also I realized that us Africans are not excited about each other and our countries, and we don't know enough about each other and our countries. So what inspired Angola was just 
changing the narrative about Africa and actually telling people that Africa is exciting. And, and the people are, us Africans were the first audience that I wanted to tap into, but also educate non-Africans so that I can never have to hear deep, dark Africa again. Um, so that was the trigger, I think, for starting Angola. It was actually doing something about the fact that we don't control our own narrative and that the rest of the world, the Western media controls the African narrative and we can only change the perception if we start owning our own narrative. <laughs> I mean, just bring in Malongo because, like I said earlier on about when I moved to the U.S., I began to know more about my country because when you hear things about your country, you're like, hold on. That's not how it really is. And you, you become mm. like that fierce advocate for your country. Mm -hmm. And I love what you're trying to do because it's not just focusing on, you know, because usually when I think about African um, platforms, sadly enough, it's all, almost always filled with celebrity news and gossips and whatnot. I'm like, there's way Absolutely. much more that, you know, we have one of the youngest, you know, growing population, a lot of on and on, um, harnessed. Uh, we can, there's so many things we can harness out of a country. And I love what your platform is doing, you know, regarding that. And I think that word dark continent, I, I, if I remember, I think it came during that Belgium conference, um, the Scrabble for Africa, where they actually described it to me in a place, that, well, it was unexplored for a very long time. That's why they call, called it dark continent, not because we're like backward, you know, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged that, you know, your platform is set to start changing that narrative. And you're right. So this is an encouragement to Africans listening to this, like get to know more about each other. And I know as a Nigerian, I should, you know, even look inwardly because we tend to be kind of proud sometimes when we think about other African countries because, you know, Nigeria dominates in a lot of spaces, you know, music, entertainment, but it's time we begin to like really know our history so we can think about ways to move forward collectively. But to be fair to us, I think things are changing. So if you think back to, I think when I was in a teenager in the 90s, a lot of the music we listened to was Western music. All the movies we watched were Western um, movies. And then suddenly in the last 20 years, like our local music has become the thing. I mean, someone posted a video yesterday of Chris Brown dancing to Roomba. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, Chris Brown is dancing to Roomba. Like, first of all, yeah, so... It, it's suddenly that we're now starting to see our culture being going mainstream, which I think is great. And when I see Western videos, especially in the U.S., you see people now in weddings are dancing into the wedding hall. We've been doing that since the 80s and, and 70s in Africa. Like I've done so many routines. And then so you're starting to see that now actually our culture is going mainstream and is becoming more acceptable. And even amongst ourselves, like we're dancing to Nigerian music like I listen to Davido and all these Nigerian artists. Like I would pick those first before I do a Western song. So I think it's that we're definitely seeing a shift where we're starting to recognize and appreciate our own, which I think is great. Yeah. But there's still a lot of work to be done. I agree. I think the internet has definitely helped to that. You know, the fast spread of sharing, you know, cultural practices and whatnot. Yeah, no, it's exciting. And actually, one thing, I wrote an article uh, on my blog in 2020 about intra-Africa tourism. So because when COVID hit, a lot of the West was closed to tourists, you started seeing like wealthy Nigerians were suddenly going to Kenya. And the interesting thing about wealthy Nigerians, as we all know, have a lot of money, is that they come in their private jets. So uh, a tourist, tourism person was telling me, he goes, Nigerians come in their private jets, take up the entire hotel. And, and then the hotels are owned by Western hotel companies. And they're like, what? This is what they do? Why? Because for them, they've always marketed their hotels to Westerners from abroad. And suddenly they're like, oh, no, we actually have to look for Africans to come. And then they're seeing wealthy Africans coming who they've never tapped into. So you're seeing a shift. I mean, the pandemic was bad, but actually it's had a lot of positives that people are not talking about because it's forced us to actually look inwards. Yeah, I'd like to Africans. hear more actually about that like um because we, we we've we've heard so much about the pandemic and how like we talk all the time about all the negatives right that have come from the pandemic um but but i like to think about things from the the, the angle that everything has its ups its upside and its downside and it's easy to focus on just one but then that means you tend to miss the other one um and one of the things that i think the pandemic did was like you said it's it created a bunch of constraints, but because of those constraints, a lot of creativity came out, a lot of innovative sort of approaches came out. And in some ways, one of the things that I think happened is the first technology, you know, forward, didn't it? Um, 
so in the UK, for instance, I remember before the pandemic, you would often enter a cab and you'd have to, they, they would not take anything other than cash. Um, and your local corner shops would not take anything other than cash. And after the pandemic, that's changed. Everybody takes cards now, right? So that technology has always been there. And the same with Zoom and all of this. And so to the question I want to ask you, one of the, actually, I want to ask you two questions. So one is, what in what ways do you think the pandemic has changed things both for Africa and just as you've traveled across the world, what, what have you seen that's in terms of upsides, right? That you think maybe are not being paid attention to enough. What else are you seeing? Oh, I think the big one was that we had to become resilient. So actually, a couple of things. So the, actually, you know, the first one in terms of the pandemic response, um, a couple, two things came out of the pandemic response. The first was that Africa actually started off really well with the response. And I remember the, the quote uh, from the president of Ghana, who said, you know, economies can come back, like we can revive economies, but we cannot revive people. And that was the emphasis on let's lock down, stay home, stay safe. Um, and the leadership that was demonstrated by uh, President Akufo Addo and President Cyril Ramaphosa was praised everywhere. So I actually wrote an article about it because I was like, <laughs> hey, hang on. Africa is actually leading the way about how you should respond because humans, ultimately, you have to protect human life. You're worried about the economy and all of that stuff. It's, it's actually secondary to ensuring that people are safe. Though, of course, in the end, it was how are we going to eat? So we're at home, we're safe, but we don't have food. So that kind of, that plan wasn't totally fo followed through. But I think the immediate reaction, Africa got a lot of praise for that. The other thing that came out of the response was that African governments were forced to work together. So South Africa being organized and very wealthy, they were the first to get vaccines, AstraZeneca, which turns out they couldn't actually use but they sold those to the rest of the continent. So we found that actually people were working together and seeing, um, you know, how can we actually best respond? And that actually worked in our favor. And I'll say at the individual level, well, actually, uh, it's still at the macro level. I mentioned tourism. Countries suddenly realize we have we, we we're relying on local tourists, but also inter Africa tourists. But even economy wise, China right now, 200 million people in China are locked down because of the new strain that they're dealing with, which God forbid, if it comes to the rest of the world, we're in trouble. Um, oh, you know, it's but, a matter of time. <laughs> and that's what's worrying me. I'm like, let me travel before we go back into lockdown. But it's it's really messed up supply chain logistics. And Africa already had really poor supply chain logistics. But now you're seeing countries saying, well, actually, how can we actually improve this? There's a lot more emphasis on, on African ports. But also, if you're paying attention to the news, there's, there's conversations about railway lines internally and also motorways to actually just try and build the supply chain logistics. So if you're following the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, it's now joined the East Africa community, and they want to be able to access the ports in Mombasa and Dar es Salaam a lot more, which is, again, is going to drive trade. So now Africa is actually saying we actually need to work together to, to make things happen. At the individual level, you've noticed that because people were at home, pandemic, they were on the internet, I feel like Africans are now kind of coming out of their shell and being more aware of what's happening around the world. So that globalization from a virtual um, perspective is happening a little bit more because people are like, well, I'm reading the news. I'm actually learning about other places. Um, and then also just being resilient about being tech savvy. My mom hardly ever, I don't even think she knew how to Facebook. She was not on Facebook. Um, I hope she doesn't listen to this podcast. She now <laughs> knows how to. <laughs> no, I, I, Africa moms are still that crazy word. Is like, <laughs> your mom my mom? They became a bit more tech savvy. It was great because they yeah, had to yeah. adapt. So I think there were some negatives, yes. And we, I lost friends to pandemics, and that was really hard. Um, but they were, it did change behavior and I think it changed behavior for the better. Actually, no better place to see Africans um, harmonizing than on TikTok, <laughs> by the way. Oh my God, I love TikTok. TikTok is, I'm, I'm, you know, when you hear people saying TikTok is addictive, I can testify. Like, if my phone can keep off after like two hours, I'd be very happy. The trends, the dance steps, I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's unity news, right there. News as well. Like, I'm getting my oh, yeah, done sure. depth trial news from tiktok because they've summarized everything <laughs> the that commentaries happens. right yeah so, yeah. So, so you yeah, have a so second question thing, it's and you kind of 
have started speaking to it, but a, a bit of context. So I work in the NHS, right? Which is amazing. And, you know, especially because I'm coming from, you know, Nigeria where we haven't got that sort of national health. We've got national insurance, but it's tied to employment, like in the US. And there's lots of people who aren't employed or who aren't employed in sort of that sort of structured senses, right? Um, but something that's in, that as I found really interesting is obviously healthcare is better here in a lot of ways. But I feel in many ways that it's not as better as I expected, right? Um, and I was I was discussing this with um, a a senior colleague recently that I feel like there's a lot more being spent in some ways for what looks like or feels like, and I'm, I'm not sure about this, but it feels in some ways like marginal um, improvements. And something I've been thinking a lot about, um, and I think I think you're going to have something to say about this because you kind of have spoken to it a, a couple of times. Something I've been thinking a lot about is, I think there's something the West may have to learn from Africa and from lots of other sort of poorer countries because I think for the little resources we have, so a lot of times there's this sort of pity that people don't have, isn't there, where it's almost like, oh, these poor people, these poor struggling souls. And nobody's thinking about it from the angle of, we are they doing so much with so little? Because given the seemingly little resources they have, they are doing, co- it's, it's quite a lot. Like I'm so much more respectful of, how, and I think we 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 tend to even look down on our own selves, don't we? We we see all the resources we don't have, and we almost downplay how much we're doing with those resources in terms of, you know, sort of again going back to that sort of in it, in innovation and creativity that's coming out of, um, of that. So the question I'm wanting to ask is, um, and, and you spoke to this earlier when you talked about the fact that you know we see that we saw that happening in the pandemic. We've seen it also in places like the fact that Nigeria, for instance, and Kenya have far developed um, financial systems in terms of, because they've used technology because they didn't have banks and they, a lot of people went bank. Well, I mean, they had banks, but there wasn't a lot of, a lot of the population wasn't banked. And so they leapfrogged that whole phrase and just went straight to tech, you know, and fintech. Um, you see that with mobile phones where a lot of people didn't have landlines. And so mobile just took over. Whereas a lot of people are still dependent on landlines and sort of, held back almost you know and i'm wondering where else you're seeing that sort of thing and what else you think the west could be learning from africa if it was looking at africa differently and 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 sort of more respectfully sorry that's a lot (laughs) yeah and i completely agree with you oh no it's 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 a really good question and it's something that i'm really passionate about so when it comes to and you and you're right we do a lot with very little so i always tell people I always like to put people down when they put Africa down, but I always remind people, and like when you go to Africa and you see people's homes, that's not bought with a mortgage. No one gets a mortgage. In Zambia, mortgage is 50%. Every, you are building with your savings and with the little that we have. But when you think about it, in the UK, in the US, everyone's like le- leveraged up to their ears, eyeballs in debt. Whereas in Africa, a lot of the times you're doing from the minimal resources, but you actually own your property outright. You own your car at second hand, but you're not owing the bank that money. It's yours outright. So we do actually do a lot with very little. And when it comes to health as well, and actually having lived in Singapore now, I have the greatest respect for traditional Chinese medicine. So I actually stopped seeing Western doctors when I was living out in Singapore, because I found that all they want to do is tests and medicine and all that stuff and i go to a tcm so try traditional chinese medicine they look at my tongue they they do my pulse um and then they they ask me a bunch of questions and they literally can figure out what's wrong with me we have traditional medicine in africa but because they're the people that inv- that usually i mean there's some crafty ones who ask for a root and a an egg and a hair and all that you've got those ones who are the shady ones but you also have the ones who work in roots they know what traditional roots actually help you with Uh, and leaves, we're not actually tapping into that market. So I had interviewed somebody from Madagascar when COVID first broke out and Madagascar said, we have a drink that can help the body with immunity. Turned out people in their own country weren't interested in it because why? Western medicine has told you, you go and get a vaccine that we've manufactured and all that stuff. So we we have an opportunity in Africa to actually tap into a lot more of our resources. But because we've been brainwashed, and we think everything that comes in the West is great. And I'll probably get into trouble for saying this, but I don't care. 
it's about time we actually started looking inwards at our at solutions to our problems. And being in Asia, where you see they actually do that and they're unapologetic about it, um, I have a greatest respect for them, and I wish we could adopt that attitude as well. So, just talking about what else we can get um, respect. So, here's a story that's trending now. I don't know Mo, if you've seen this, but Spain is about to pass a law which allows women. In, it's going to be part of labor laws, women to take time off for menstrual pain. We've had that in Africa, well, at least in Zambia, we've had that for decades. So there's a lot of things that we, again, we think our labor laws are very nascent and whatnot. But actually, if you, if you sit down and you read the labor laws, it goes back to the response that from um, President Akufo Addo about protecting a human life. African culture and our laws really put humans at the center so if you're thinking about the new um, fifth industrial revolution i didn't even know i thought we're still on the fourth but apparently 5.0 is about humans so africa has always put took. humans first we put families <laughs> first we put... <laughs> but this is the thing right <laughs> oh, <laughs> but only thing in 5.0 is it says intersection of humans and intelligent computers so we're still behind on the intelligent <laughs> computers but it's about being human so there's a lot yeah. of stuff that i think this is where we can actually put out you know we can come up with ideas for that human side of the equation uh, because we're doing that anyway it's in our nature so there's a lot of stuff and maybe this is the stuff i want to show surface um a lot uh in my blog is where africa is that was my response to the, the menstrual law thing i was like we're already doing this but no one gives us credit for having thought about this so we have to actually start showcasing best practice that already exists in africa wow It's a lot of work, though, because because we ourselves, A, we don't know that it exists, or if we know, we don't think it's important enough. I mean, the menstrual pain yeah. thing, it seems like no big deal, but my reaction was like, okay, we've been doing that. So it's making the news everywhere. And I'm like, it's been in our labor laws. So what else is in our labor laws that actually the world should be doing? That was my question to my, my friends and an article I need to write. Wow. I mean, again, thank you for just you know, putting those into words, especially what we as Africans can begin to, um, how we can really position ourselves to not only advocate for our continent, but um, and even having pride, you know, for being African. And I think it's one of the things that's really, really missing. And I guess along with the, along that line of just what Ungolo has been doing through how you, you know, explore different aspects of, you know, culture, you know, news, politics and all that, What would you say is that biggest stereotype about Africa? And I know Africa is such a huge continent, by the way, that you disdain. And perhaps another way of asking this question would be, what was that for that really, what was that drive that forged you to start your brand as a way of correcting some of the things, you know, you've been hearing about Africa? Well, I think I touched on it briefly, so I might have preempted this question, but it was just that thing about Africa is completely devoid of civilization and that we're basic people. I mean, I still get that to this day. But the story that always I always remember when I think of my, my childhood was uh, a friend of mine whose cousin, I think, went to live in and study in Bulgaria and arrived in Bulgaria, I think it was in the 80s. And people were like, oh, you're from Africa. Do you live in trees? And this guy had was just tired of at, being <sighs> asked the same stupid questions. So he said, yeah, and your ambassador lives in the biggest tree. So then it made the person think like, oh, Help someone, me, Jesus. someone from my country has gone to Africa to live in a tree. It's like, why would you ask these questions? And I think of my childhood as well. Like, I've been asked the most bizarre questions. But you know what's interesting is the reason I don't get angry and, I, and I'm always amused by this is it just shows the level of ignorance. So people think Africans are not civilized, but actually when you think of what we're taught in school, where we even know where the, what the capital of Paris is or the cap capital of Germany or the capital of, of Turkey, most Africans know their geography. Most Africans yeah. know their history. And so we're more knowledgeable than a lot of people around the world. So when people look at us and think that we're not civilized, that we don't even know, like we've never traveled, like people would ask me, is this your first time on a plane? And fine, I know people haven't traveled, but I was like, no, actually, it was my first time in economy. Um, but this is a comment I gave in Oxford. And I'm like, we just suck like, it. Yeah, no, I was like, it was my first time to travel a coach because I wasn't with my parents who were diplomats. So I'm like, what are, what are you asking me? So don't make assumptions about about who you think I am. So that's the stereotype that I, I really struggle with. And also that you don't have ideas. So you sit at a table, and I've, and I've experienced this many times in corporate 
you say something. So for me, I'm a black African woman and young. It, well, I was relatively young. So I have four things working against me. And so you say something and you articulate a point and people just ignore it. And somebody else repeats word for word what you just said and everyone hears. That thing of not being heard and seen because I'm irrelevant is probably the biggest thing other than the lack of civilization that grates me. And a lot of Africans experience this when living in the West. And it's really frustrating. Mm. <sighs> I, I, I believe it's going to take like lights. Yes, like fix that. But um, slowly we begin to change that narrative because Africans are everywhere. And another thing I like to drop in that had to be an average African is like bilingual. Like we we speak at least two languages, right? So <laughs> chuck on that, the West people. Anyways, um, yeah, the next question is someone like Shonda, right? So Shonda yeah, rhymes. Yeah, Shonda rhymes. And uh-huh. now everyone is is talking about Bridgerton. Bridgerton. Uh-huh. So that's the model that we need to. We need to follow. The challenge we have is that we're not running things. So our mentality, and I think of the way we were raised, uh, like I was raised in Zambia and a lot of my peers as well. Our education system is not breeding leaders. We're breeding followers. And who are we following? The West. Until we're the ones who are, again, controlling the narrative by owning our own platforms and you're controlling what is being said. We're the ones creating products that go global. Uh, we're the ones employing people and we're basically the ones in charge and 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 setting the direction. Until we fix those things, we won't have a voice. On what platform do we have if we're not we're not in charge? So along that line, um, because even thinking about the history of just what happened in Africa during that so Africa, actually, during that whole scramble for Africa after the Berlin, um, the Belgium, I, I don't know why I keep calling it Berlin, the Belgium conference. Um, and I still think that there's still some impact of, you know, post-colonization happening in a lot of African countries. Take, for example, Nigeria. Yeah, the UK must have left many years ago, but have they really, really left? Do you think it's, um, I mean, I guess my question for you around this would be, it's easy to say we need to, like, pull ourselves out of our both strings, but we're still being controlled, you know, maybe behind the scenes. Like, I mean, take what's happening in Cameroon with France and all that. How easy will it be for us to really break ourselves free from just this oppression by the West? No, but look at Mali. It's good that you mentioned that. Mali is a classic example of that question. So Mali, um, second coup, I think I wrote about this because uh, Colonel Asima Goita, I, and I apologize, I haven't pronounced his name properly because it's French, uh, but he fascinates me because he did two coups in two years. 38-year-old colonel, and then ECOWAS was like, oh, no. And ECOWAS, by the way, the people who, who told him, this is unacceptable, you need to bring back the democracy, democratically elected people, ha- two or three of them themselves had also come in via coups to talk about the pot calling the pet of black. But what was interesting about this guy, he's like, <laughs> no, I'm going to stay in power. And also, French army bounce. Like, get out of my country. And then I'm going to get protection from Russia which is what Syria did. And the reason why Assad has not fallen is because Putin's his daddy. Um, Goethe has done the same thing, being protected by Russia. But he basically told the French to bounce. So what's happening? What, what's changed? Why, why do we allow people to? Why, why, where is the fear on telling people to leave? Who's stopping us? So we're afraid of what? They'll come and invade us. But because we don't even defend each other. So Echo was condemning Mali. I'm like, okay, yes, I, I don't I agree with them. A coup is never great. But actually, let's take a step back and understand if if we're fighting Western oppression by the French, we should be standing with each other and not standing with the French. And that's where I have a problem. Like we're not even defending ourselves. So who, who's stopping us from kicking them out? Uh, you know what? That's a very good point. And I think it goes back to even thinking about when you have countries vacating, countries that have been oppressing, they always leave people in power that serves their own purposes, right? Like, you know, even South Korea and um, Sigmund Rhee um, and what's even happening in Cameroon. And I think maybe some of the leaders have been putting in power. I think some of the people we have in power are just they're almost like puppets. And until we start thinking about putting leaders that have nationalist, nationalistic interests at heart, it's just going to be the same problem all over again. Yeah, but but again, this is the thing. So when I also have this conversation, the pushback I get is, 
but you're living in London, come back and, and stand for election. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's your response to that, by the way? When does it come back and fix the country? So, first of all, I, I'm sorry. I, I came back. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> so I, I, I actually... I remember that. you bought a farm or something. You bought a house, you bought a farm or something well, like that. I still invest in Zambia. I own like 2,300 acres of land and I, I continue to invest in my country. I And I go there very often, but I don't want to full-time live there. I probably will not live there full-time. Like I can do a couple of months on end. I have family. My parents are there. I'm there two, three times a year. I'm investing a lot in, in Africa. I think you can contribute. I'm choosing to contribute economically as opposed to pol- politically. But the thing is, you need to contribute. And so I, you're right about the politics. But I always say to people, whenever people complain, oh, these politicians, politicians reflect the society. So actually, yeah. like when we're talking about all oh, politicians are corrupt, actually, the whole society is probably corrupt. Like <laughs> what the practices you're seeing is. So we need to actually start looking at ourselves individually and saying how am i contributing to this problem am i actually going out to vote so people don't even vote but they're the first to complain i mean it's a bigger problem it will take a really long time so you're in the u.s when you think of the american history they've been independent since 1776 they used to kill each other fight and and all the things Mm -hmm. that we see 100 up to uh, less than 100 years ago 100 years ago it will take time But I think, and this is where one of the ethos, American ethos that I really like is the individual bit is if each of us individually fix our our stuff, that each of us fix ourselves and we contribute, we are, yeah, we're contributing individually. Collectively, we'll all be fixed. What happens now is one person who contributes and a hundred will just sit back and, and watch. Yeah, yeah. It's like how even in Nigeria we put so much emphasis on the president, like the 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 office of the president. But a lot of corruption actually happens in the local constitu- constituency, and I think it's you know you view that it's it's. It, I mean, the president has little or no power over what's happening on your street, and that's and all where that. the, that's where the trouble happens. But I'll tell you yeah. one thing actually. I think that we'll notice that Africa has changed when politicians are no longer the the, the pinnacle of society. And that's the difference mm-hmm. between Africa and the West and, and the even West, Asia yeah. to some extent where politicians are like by the side. No one is aspiring to be a politician. But in Africa, literally almost every country, everyone wants to be a politician. Why? Because that's the quickest way to get rich. That's Money, when you have yeah. a problem. But, but yeah. if you think about it, a couple of years ago, Belgium did not have a government for nine it's to you, but this is the thing. Everyone wants to be a politician. Why? That, that should be the, they're, they're the least paid people. Like the UK prime it minister. should be. But <laughs> <laughs> even everywhere else, right? Their official salaries are the least paid. But Nigerians paid. just left, Nigerian leaders just left the chat room right now because they're the highest, one of the highest paid in the world. Exactly. Do you I know you how much our senators make? <laughs> how much you make? Tell me. Oh, uh, I can't even remember, but they get a lot of allowances, like bedroom allowances, furniture allowances. Bedroom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, I'm going to Google that for a bit, but you can go ahead and show us. <laughs> Here, the prime minister gets 180000 I think, maximum for if everything per year. But yeah, when you see people not aspiring to be politicians, then you know society has evolved. And that's the thing. You mentioned South Korea. South Korea, the, the business financial sector is quite massive. And so people get by and politicians are there. But for us, if the politicians are not functioning, then the whole country collapses. That's a problem. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So we get paid about. I just looked it up. It's about two thousand pounds a joking. month, plus allowances of up to thirty-seven thousand pounds a 40, month. Forty thousand pounds. Yep. If you can see the breakdown, it's month. just crazy. Financial allowance a no, month, per month. Yeah. For senators. And do you know how many bills they pass? A month. Like, do you know how much it takes to like get things done there? They don't do. They don't. It's almost like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That's why wow. I don't want to, you know, become politics or like, politicians in my country. It's very I lucrative. I have to my Nigerian guy whose father is American. <laughs> I know why they have a nice house in Houston. Uh, I, I guess my, my follow-up question before we move into your career and all that would be, what culture in Africa have you been most challenged by? Oh, we're too passive. So it goes back to the point about what's stopping us from kicking people out. I think we're too passive. We We allow ourselves to be subjugated and made to feel inferior. Um, it really drives me nuts. We don't stand up for ourselves. I'll give you one example. And I was explaining this to a friend of mine in Zambia. So whenever people are talking about LGBTQ rights in Africa and 
you, like in Zambia, for example, you hear, oh, no, we're a Christian nation. This is not OK and all that stuff. And then you see the the Western ambassadors start talking about it. So actually, our previous president kicked out the U.S. ambassador like two, three years ago because he condemned the jailing of a gay couple and booted him out and said, this is in our country. We don't do this. And all the Western ambassadors condemned and everything. And I was telling my friends, I said, do you know why the West talks about this? And I'm not saying this is not an, an important issue, but why is it that only in Zambia does this get talked about by every Western donor when we've got other problems, pressing problems that are that are that need our attention? And it's to oh. divide us, it's to keep us divided and arguing amongst ourselves about other issues, why big things get bit, get missed. And the reason I say this is in Singapore, it's illegal. The Supreme Court last year, the year before upheld the ban on any um, same-sex marriages. Did you hear anything from the U.S. Embassy, EU, from the Britons? Zero. Nothing. Uh -uh. Why Uh -uh. is it that they feel comfortable enough to talk down on us and tell us how we should run our countries, but they will never do that to other countries? We need to stand up for ourselves. I can tell you, I get into trouble because I stand up for myself all the time. I do not take kindly to Africans being talked down on. I will jump back. I'm like a Rottweiler when people say something that is really negative. I just cannot stand for it. And I would love for us as countries and as people to learn to stand up for ourselves because we are too passive. I mean, you're so right. And I think it goes back to of our dependence on the West because I think, was it Kenya or Uganda where I think it was during Obama's presidency where they were threatening to withhold some funds if they didn't over overturn the ban on homosexuality and all that in that country. You're right. I mean... It happens in other parts of the world, and why are we being? Why is that being used as a way to almost like ground us to uh, a bad level? But whatever, um, they make things worse because in Singapore it's illegal, but they don't enforce it. It's the same thing in Zambia. Yeah. I have friends who are gay. No one chases them. So it's a law because it's aligned with our Christian, but actually no one's actually really doing anything about it. But because you're coming and making noise, you're putting spotlight on something that actually has been going on for so long and no one's really talking about it because that's the way we're managing things and you're making yeah. things work. Thank you. Thank you. I, w- I wanted to ask you about, um, just because we're running out of time, um, and I really wanted to, um, you know, um, yeah, f- so that people get a chance to hear about your book, um, Millennials Guide to Work. I had a question about that. Just, it sounds like it's a play on sort of like the Guide, Japanese yeah. um, way, you know, like the way Japanese uh, people would say that sort of yeah, thing. Is that, that's what that was meant well, to be, yeah? For, I wanted a simple right. title, but I also didn't want to say guide. And then I remembered Gaido. So that's basically what it is. <laughs> so tell us, tell us a bit about that and um, tell us a bit about it, why you wrote it, what you hope people will get from it um, and obviously how they can get it and um, what are you working on next? Okay, so basically the Millennials Guide to Work is a mentoring guide for young professionals um, who are navigating the workplace and the book was uh, inspired by the fact that a lot of young people always ask me for advice when they were graduating from university, um, looking for jobs, how to apply for jobs, how to do interviews. So I used to go to my old university in Zambia and do CV and interview clinics. Um, it's something I love to do when I'm back home because you'd be surprised by just how 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 hard it is to write a proper CV, but also how hard it is to answer basic interview questions. So I started typing the stuff out. And when people would ask me for advice, I literally would just click send and send the PDF. And I thought, well, why don't I just write a book? Because that would save me the trouble of repeating the same message every time. Um, and so I, I self-published this book. It's available on Amazon. Um, and that, that's really why I wrote the book. Um, and then what am I working on next? So I started writing a book called The Secret Lives of Gen Z last year um, because I'm really fascinated by this generation. Uh, they think differently. They're also very different from like, I'm a Gen X. Um, and when I look at them, there are things that they do that I'm inspired by. Like they're sort of more free than I feel like we were raised. Um, we were raised to get a job, go to school, go to university, get a job, get a pension and retire. Whereas this generation is just like, I'm going to do things on my own term. But also at the same time, unlike us who were like, our parents were very tough on us. Um, this generation is like, they had too much love and that's kind of made them a little soft. So they have some some things that I really like and some things that I think they need some help. Um, and also their parents, their parents, they don't have that 
open communication with their parents. So I was curious about exploring a lot of these dynamics, and that's why I call it the secret lies of Gen Z. But the challenge I have is I'm doing way too much.、Um, I'm actually burning out at the moment, so it's one of the things I put the pause on because between my day job and、um, running Angolo, I just don't have time,、um, and it's affecting my health as well. So I'm having to pace okay, myself. Please, a please、bit. pace yourself.、Um, yeah. Yeah, I imagine like a good cup of tea is going to let you sleep for a long time, so it's going to come out really rich. And、mm-hmm. I read your book. I think this was probably about four years ago when I brought you on the show, and I I think my favorite chapter, if I remember, is chapter two. When you talked about、um, making mistakes, right, and and I love that you're very passionate about younger、uh, the young, younger generation because we know as Africa that's one of the ways we're actually, I think when we if we were to kind of、um, develop it's harnessing the power of our youth because a lot of Asian countries don't have that resource you know like for example in Japan、um, they're having you know lower birth rates and whatnot and I also like that your book it's it's written from you have other stories that you put on there、um, and even helping people to understand when to make a switch you know in their career and you know how to find add more value to yourself so I'm going to turn this back to you、um, Longo I know you've done quite a lot you you've worked in oil and gas then you worked in、um, I think as in in man- management consulting in London you've worked with different emerging bar- banks in Zambia South Africa. Dubai, even in、um, Singapore, for those who might be listening to this and might be considering making a switch in their careers, I guess my question for you would be: What are some of、um, the tips for people who are looking to switch careers but don't know where to start from? Okay, so just to clarify, I work for the same bank in all those countries, by the way. So, Ooh, <laughs> so, yeah, me a lot. So basically. Yeah, they have offices all over the world. So they're like, "Do you want to live here?" So I did Zambia, South Africa, Dubai, and Singapore,、uh, which was fun. Well, that's、like、good. Good on you, Dad. For multinational, like that's actually something on my job. It has to be an international company. Really? And I need okay. So that's always been strategic. But basically, I spent seventeen years in corporate. I really enjoyed it, but I reached a point where I was tired. I needed a break. So actually, I'd been asking for a sabbatical. I couldn't get a sabbatical. They wouldn't let me go. Uh, but I got to a stage where I was tired and I just wanted to rest. But also, I just felt like I was working for a paycheck and a great bonus and to go on holiday, but not feeling starting to feel like I I wasn't giving back and a little empty in my heart. Like, what am I doing with my life? Am I having an impact?、Um, and so, when I decided to take a break last year, initially I wanted to spend a year traveling throughout Africa, really build content for Angolo because I've only visited fourteen out of the fifty four. Slash fifty five. I always think of Western Sahara. So, you know, fifty four countries, but fifty five you consider Western Sahara. So, I wanted to actually travel throughout the continent and and get content for the blog. But because of pandemic,、um, and also there's an opportunity to help a philanthropy build this leadership program that I'm working on now for fifteen seventeen year olds, and that's how I stumbled into philanthropy. So, the question about switching, I think, is really important、um, because. I don't know if I've made a complete switch or I've just taken a pause. So when I explain what I'm doing now, I say I've taken a break from corporate because I do like the corporate world. Like I'm very business focused.、Um, I like a certain environment which is high paced,、um, and that's not really what you get in philanthropy. But I'm working on something that is really about filling that hole in my heart about. Giving back about helping talent. So the program I'm working on is finding brilliant 15, 17 year olds around the world. Some of our kids are refugees. We have kids from Kalaba, by the way,、um, and par- rural parts of Nigeria. Yeah, it's great. Some kids who don't、Aww. have a computer and submitted handwritten. So it's an opportunity for me to give、um, to open up this amazing opportunity to study anywhere in the world, fully funded、um, to kids from. All over the world, like rural parts of Peru,、um, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, it's it's really fascinating. So, just to go back to career switches, so I know you have to think about it very carefully about what it is you want to do because there is no perfect job. And I always tell tell people the grass ain't greener anywhere.、Um, so, to for you to think about what is it I want to switch, you need to be clear about the things that you like. The kind of、um, like to do on a daily basis. Like I don't like routine; it's just not my thing. I can never do like a I, like I'm an accountant. I could never be an accountant. I'm trained an accountant, but I could never do an accounting job. Like just looking at spreadsheets every day, I would die.、Um, so you need to know what kind of work you like, what kind of environment you like, the kind of people you want to work with. Like be super clear about that. 
do an audit about the environment that you're in because usually a switch is triggered by something. It's I'm not happy in my job or I'm tired. Like I was tired, but not necessarily uh, terribly unhappy in my job. Um, so think about what is that's driving that need to switch. And after you do an audit about the environment, decide whether it's really a switch or break. So what's interesting is after I left, quite a few people in my old office have actually taken sabbaticals because it's so important. Sometimes you don't really want to leave, but you just want wow. to break. So Thank ask you. yourself that question. And other times it's because you genuinely are in the wrong sector. Mm. Um, and speak to people in the environment where you think you want to go and ask people who will tell you the truth. Because that's another thing. People will always oversell, undersell a place. So make sure you get advice from someone you trust and say, is this really, um, is this really a place that I want to go to? So think through it very carefully. Um, and then if you're brave enough, then take the switch. But sometimes you need a break. So I would say before you make a career switch, ask for an extended leave break for one to two months. Do some thinking about whether it is you really want to switch. Uh, and if you're clear about that and do your homework, then I would say make the move. But it's very risky. Thank you so much. And I imagine the the one of the best ways to actually get by that is to work for an MNC. So they can, you know, switch you around the world and you can decide, exactly. oh, maybe it was that location I didn't like. <laughs> exactly. The, oh, the departments. Like I moved departments, I moved location. It's actually a good way to fix a problem without leaving a company. But sometimes you genuinely need a switch and, and make that switch. But I'll just say... Do not take the decision lightly uh, because mm. you can you can find yourself jumping from the fi- the frying pan into the fire if you're not careful. That is so true. And I like because we don't really think of taking breaks. So thanks for emphasizing the importance of that. Um, before you go, I, I, I have to ask this question. Sorry, Malongo. And this is about um, road scholarship. So um, I know you were one of the recipients and now you're on the other side of things. And I want to say congratulations because we know that, you know, selection rate is about is it 1% or 0.7% across the world. So that's really, really prestigious. I guess um, my question would be, what are some of the um, guiding uh, guide, guidance or guiding principles or just for those who might be considering applying for that, what kind of tips would you give them? And I guess before you answer that would be, what does the road scholarship, what, how has it really impacted your life? Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that question because the window for application is actually opening on the 1st of June. So basically, Rhodes Scholarship is still by far the most prestigious grad program in the world, and it's a graduate. So you have to have had an undergrad degree, um, and it's a grad program to Oxford. Um, so Cecil Rhodes, yes, big big bad dude from history, who left oh, his dear, money, yeah. um, <laughs> left his money um, and to bring leaders from select countries to study at Oxford. Um, and so... The criteria is to pick people who are academically excellent, but also people who are well-rounded. So have demonstrated mastery in something, be it sports um, or, you know, music or whatever else you do outside of, of, you have to be well-rounded. So it's not just about books. It's, do you have something that you're passionate about? Do you give back to society? Do you have evidence of having led something? So you could be, you know, the uh, prefect in your school or have led your club or whatever. But we want people who actually demonstrate that they lead, but also people who care about others. So are you volunteering? Are you giving back to society in whatever way? So those are the four criteria that we look for. Um, so if you are interested, so you, you're a recent graduate or about to graduate from university uh, because the application process starts 1st of June and depending on which constituency you belong to. So we do have constituencies because Cecil wrote his will in a specific way. So, for example, Nigeria is part of West Africa. Um, and if you are from, I don't know, which countries, um, give me a country. Cote d'Ivoire, I think, I'm not sure if Cote d'Ivoire is in West Africa, but the website. Tanzania, maybe. Tanzania is in East Africa. So, like, yeah. DRC is not in East Africa. It's part of global. So, mm-hmm. so if anyone is interested, the first step would be to go to roadshouse.ox.ac.uk and look under scholarship because you type in your country and then it tells you which constituency to apply for. And then you just do your application. It asks you for a statement. Um, and the statement is really just interrogating your motives and your ambition and all the things that you want to do. But also there's a minimum threshold for your grades um, that you have to have achieved. But it really is an amazing scholarship. You go up to Oxford, you meet an amazing network of people. Um, It opens doors to lots of opportunities. So when I was doing my grad, applying for jobs after university, a lot of the times we're fast-tracked 
through the early processes to like first or second round um it's almost automatic that you get an interview to almost anywhere just by having roads on your cv especially if you're in the u.s by the way so in the world u.s australia are the places where if you are a road scholar like you're so set um, more so than maybe other countries uh but it's still very prestigious so it does open you up to a lot of opportunities it's a great network of people um, right now in biden's cabinet um commerce secretary transport secretary road scholars Um, in Australia, we've had prime ministers, Rhodes Scholars, Bill Clinton, of course, former president, Rhodes Scholar. So lots of people who've done well in politics, in business, um, in academia as well, quite a few. Um, so it's a great, it's an amazing um, opportunity to to just put yourself on the fast track. So I definitely say apply. So 1st of June, the window opens, please do apply. Um, and don't worry about your country now with a global constituency literally anybody in the world can apply and you'll be happy to know we had our first korean south korean um road scholar as well uh-huh. and I just, <laughs> have you finally been? no i was supposed to go 2020 then covid happened i went Booked my flight. i, I, I know you, i know you told me I, i have all of the list of things to do there i want to go to that dmz because you told me about your trip and all that I'm going to have to wait until next year because, you know, the rain close for my time and all that. Sorry, Ayamide. No, I was going to say, I guess you could say Rose Scholarship is the road to many. All right, I'll see myself oh my out God. now. I knew <laughs> the daddy's joke was coming. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. The first we... world and Road Scholar is the, ro- the road. I'm going to use all we of that. We can end this podcast now. Oh, my gosh. I mean, they're choosing much. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, that we, was, we can't, we that can't end. Brilliant. But I do have one more question before we finish up. <laughs> If you'll forgive my 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 terrible joke, um, <laughs> so you you I love you said oh thank you <laughs> you said um, don't encourage him now Mulongo. Well, Mulongo has <laughs> she's encouraged me and and that's it. I don't care what anyone says anymore. It's all over now. <laughs> um, you you spoke earlier about feeling you know like you were there was too much going on that you need to take a break. You need to take a pause. Um, And and I thought I wanted to, to just go back to that for a second because um, I'm sure that's something a lot of people relate to um, for all sorts of reasons. Definitely since the pandemic um, with, you know, in the last two years, we've all been sort of trying to figure out new ways of working, new ways of being. Um, and 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 we're still all sort of figuring, figuring it out, aren't we? And that's not counting the fallouts of other things that have happened, um, whether in terms of professional or personal life. Um, so what, 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 I mean, no, obviously everybody's going to have to figure it out, but I thought maybe if you could share some, some of how you walk through it for yourself, um, maybe, maybe people might get some ideas of things they could do themselves. Um, so yeah, basically how do you handle all the multiple balls you juggle? Um, how do you, deal with all the obviously th- variety of things that you're gifted at and, and interested in. Oh my gosh. I'm not doing too well at this right now. I have to say, so I'm really tired. Um, like literally I feel like I'm burning out. I'm also very hard on myself. So I've got my day job, which normally would be like nine to 7 p.m. Um, every day, Monday to Friday. And I'm also one of those people who's super focused. So if I'm doing work, I'm doing work. Um, and then after 7 p.m., I try. I have to take a mental break because I can't switch. Like I can't mentally switch immediately. And if I've had a rough day, it takes me two hours to do that break. If it's, if it's been an easy day, okay day, then I can mentally switch in like 30 minutes, an hour. And then I'm on the angular mode, really from like 8 to to ideally 10 p.m. so that I used to work out in the morning. That's just gone through the window. So if I'm writing an article, sometimes I'm up from 8 to like 2 a.m. because um, I, I had this ambition to do two articles every week. And as a result, I was not sleeping. So sometimes I'd go 2 a.m., sometimes 3, 4 a.m. and still wake up at eight to start working at nine. And so it was really, I was just, it was affecting my health. Like I've gained weight again back in the UK because I can't work out and I'm just eating really badly. Um, and so I've really had to pace myself um, and also focus. So I've dialed down the amount of blogging I can do to one a week. Like this week I was in Oxford. I've been working till like eight, nine. I haven't blogged, but also I'm, I've learned to be kinder to myself. So I'm like my biggest critic and I, I push myself to, really a high standard that 
even when I feel like I'm failing, I'm still winning at some level. Um, and so I've learned to be kinder to myself. It's probably the first thing and recognize that I can't do it all um, is the first tip I'll give you because we are human and it is true what they say. We have one body, one life, like really respect that. Uh, so be kind to yourself. The second thing is prioritize because you may have different interests and want to do it all, but the reality is you cannot. So I've had to force myself to prioritize and say, what is the most important thing to me? So as much as I love to write and I want to see The Secret Lives of Gen Z published, I've had to put that on the back burner. Right now, my focus is on Angolo and growing uh, my reader base um, is, is top priority in addition to my job and really trying to take care of my health. So I'd say prioritizing. And the second thing, is the third thing rather, so be kind is number one. Um, prioritize is number two and the third thing is learning to say no more so I ha sometimes have to show my friends my calendar so you can see the number of people who want to call and ask for my advice on something so at some point I think I will be a consultant because I'm already doing that for free so people will call me in for business advi uh, advice what do you think or my kids need to my kids are not focused at school like I actually do this I'm like a super auntie but I'm the auntie who you call when your kids are not focused in school and you need to set them right. So friends <laughs> ship me, ship their children over and I'm doing Zoom calls. So, or I was doing business uh, advisory or like in LinkedIn today, I've had two requests to for advice. I've had to start saying no because I'm like, guys, if where, when am I going to sleep, do my job, do Angolo, rest and all that stuff. So I think the third thing is just learning to say no and being comfortable saying no because I don't like to let people down. I'm just used to being available. It's probably the three tips I'd ha I'd, I would give out. Be kind to yourself, prioritize and be comfortable saying no if you just simply cannot do it all. Wow, Mungo. Thank you. I mean, it does really fit into like mental health prioritization. And I guess for people, you know, with your personality, and I think I can relate to that. We get things done, but we get burnt out easily. And again, being kind to oneself, I think is really, really big. And so something you said that reminded me of something my advisor told me when I was in grad school. She said, not everything has to have your 100%, you know, that if your your average is actually someone else's, you know, 100%. And and that has really helped to set me free in some areas where I go to some meetings. And I'm like, I don't have to be the one doing all the talking. I could just, you know, take a back seat and just listen. And so thanks for that reminder of being well, kind hey, to ourselves. There's a negative to our, our personality, right? So I'm told yeah. off like, sometimes because people are like, why do you think you are the only one who can fix our problems? And actually, they always <laughs> said to me, like I've gotten in trouble recently, once at work and once at home for... Uh, one into intervening in something which I could see. So this is another thing about my personality. I'm like a chess player. So I'm not looking at the immediate situation in front of me. I literally Future. am playing it. Like, you know, chess players will play yeah. the whole match yeah. in their head. That's yeah. how my yeah. brain works. So you, you present a problem <laughs> to me or I see something and I'm like, I guarantee you in two days, this is going to be the scenario. <laughs> and some people at work will say to me, but why are you always looking over the hill? And I was like, I don't know. I have that ability to look over the hill. So I can literally tell you this is what's going to happen. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> I got told off. You're meddling. You're intervening. You're not. Your your intervention is not welcome. Well, two weeks later, the thing that I said was going to happen happened. And this happens a lot to me. But also, I learned, and I said, you know what? That's actually really good feedback. Why am I getting involved? Um, I read something, that, and this is a good place to to end as well. Is there's someone posted something on LinkedIn, which I said is going to be my life's motto. It tell says, me, tell it's me. Albert Einstein. He said, clever people solve problems. Wise people avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> I said, from now on, I'm, I'm, I'm wise. Other people's business. I'm going to be wise. I see train crash. You're going, I'm just like, no. <laughs> I, I my it was really good feedback it was negative feedback but actually it made me realize that sometimes stay out of things yep yep i just <laughs> journal i put stuff on my journal a lot like things i i, I want to say but i can't say because i've already so, bought that fridge. i so, just go to my journal and talk about it yeah so my journal can so, be super nice for like an evidence in the future <laughs> sorry go ahead, say something, something i often say to people um because so the the, the work i do often involves um, a lot of like mentoring and teaching. Um, and one thing I've learned, and I've, I've, I've always loved teaching, but one thing you learn when you 
teach. And I think maybe this is this is not a reason people give for not liking to teach, but I suspect it's probably more of a reason than most people realize who don't like teaching. Is that growth and efficiency are on a spectrum. And to get more of one, you're going to have to sacrifice the other. And I don't think people think about that enough. And so you find that people who prize yeah. efficiency too much, what they end up doing is want to do everything themselves because nobody can do it as well as you. And of course they can't because that's what growth means, right? So it's like, and I think of it like carrying a child. The easiest way to get a child from A to B is to literally carry them. But how long are you going to do that for? <laughs> so at some point, you're going to have to let them walk by themselves and it's going to waste your time. But it's going to save you time in the long run yeah. because they will then get to where they can uh. walk without you, you know, but you're going to have to go through that slow phase. And and I think people often are so focused on efficiency sometimes. And so, yeah, and ultimately it's a form of efficiency, but it's sort of recognizing that, you know what? So what, what I tell people who are so focused on efficiency is, consider am i sacrificing growth here without realizing it because something is always being traded off and if you don't think about the trade-off it's easy to focus on the thing you're focused on and not realize because the thing you're trading off is 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 invisible so it's easy to just ignore it but that doesn't mean it's not happening um so yeah that's just something i just thought I'd, i'd chip in there that you might resonate with my grandmother will totally agree with you. So in my grandmother's generation, if you see a child going to touch the stove, you don't stop them because they're like, that's the only way they'll learn yeah. that the stove is dangerous. So it's not to put the finger on the plate, but you know, like the oven is a bit warm. They yeah. will not stop the child because then the yeah. child will touch it and will never again touch the stove. And I used to think, oh my God, but now our generation, oh my God, we've got child proofing and all that stuff. That's why we're raising kids who just crumble at the slightest, slightest inconvenience. Whereas in our generation, it was tough love, but it made us grow faster. So I totally yeah. agree with you. Another thing, African culture, we need to bring back. Natural consequences, yeah. <laughs> Go do it. Yes. Oh, we can talk and talk. I think we need to have another conversation. I know, I know. You're so refreshing. You're so refreshing. Oh my gosh. Why did I wait so long to bring you back? I think because I was We're gonna busy. Have to... and, yeah. I think that's it. That's it. That's this it. That's crazy. it. But at least now I'm stable. I'm in London. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying okay. to adjust. But let's have we another We need a live question. show. We need a live show with you. Like just, you know, engaging our listeners as well. But we'll set it up. We'll set something up. Definitely. It's Definitely been so much fun back. talking to you. And nice meeting you, Amida, as well. Let's get together when you're in London, if you're ever in London. Oh, man. Mulongo, thank you so much. This this has been such a wonderful conversation. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I am in London fairly regularly. Well, not regularly, but fairly frequently. Um, I'm, so Ipswich is about a, an hour and a half north of northeast of London, so it's east of England, really, where I am. Um, so it's not too far; it's a single train, except on Sundays. Ugh. Anyway, but that's that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing um, all that you have about um, your your work, your your passion for Africa. Um, your insightful and refreshing um, thoughts and and um, yeah and everything you've also shared about career and and what you've you know just what you've done and what you've learned um, and I, I yeah I, I there's there's just this this is this is one episode that I would definitely be listening to again myself to be honest just just to sort of get into that zone where you know I'm not I'm just listening and in, and just enjoying so you know everything you've said so thank you so much for for coming on and for giving so much of yourself. Thanks for having me. It's been so much fun. And I look forward to the return, the live show. We definitely should do a live show. It'd be great to get. Yes. 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 I mean, and keep up the work with Ongolo. I'm going to put all of that. We're going to put the the link and people can find your website and all that. And the book as well. I'm going to link that in the show notes. And once the episode um, comes out, we'll let you know, we'll send you all of the blurbs and audiograms and flyers and links to listen and download to share them with your contacts. But thank you so much. This was very, very rich. We talked about so many things and, you know, thank you. <laughs> thank you. 
All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone. This has been more and. I'm a day. I'm Malongo. We're Malongo. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> Bye. You too. Thanks.